Thank you, sir. The Ministry of Health prepared a health sector master plan to provide health care services for the IDPs, including curative, preventive, promotive, and rehabilitative services. And the health, the, the actors involved in providing health services for the IDPs has to adhere to this plan, whereas this included human resource and the medical supply services. At the ground level, at the grassroots in many firm, we established a directorate of IDP healthcare, whereas we had about more than 100 doctors and other 2,000 health workers. And each IDP welfare village, there's a referral hospital which function 24 seven, and there are a primary health, couple of primary healthcare centers which functions as OPD. And there was a separate ambulance pool to transport patients to secondary and tertiary healthcare facilities which are close by. From IDP healthcare center, about eight, ki eight kilometer distance, there's a secondary healthcare facility and a tertiary healthcare facility which is about 30 kilometer distance. As in any emergency, the IDPs, they came with lots of communicable diseases such as hepatitis C, typhoid, diarrhea, dysentery, and chickenpox. But with the very well established preventive healthcare services, the government of Sri Lanka managed to overcome when it was very high during the period of May, by early uh, June, it was very, very less. Soon, soon after a complex, uh, complex emergency as such, the psychosocial activities are very, very important. Our priority was to provide psychosocial services for children initially. So whereas we established psychosocial centers, known as happiness centers, and we conducted art therapy, such as crea like creative therapy as art, drama, and even we brought children coming, uh, going to the other part of the country. So children, they, the, many of those children, they were born during the war. So for them, the war is normal. So it's very important for them to bring out from that. So the wise men say, when you have clouds in your mind, there'll be water coming from your eyes. So we never tried to wipe the water off. We never tried to wipe the tear off from their eyes. We, our, we tried our level best to take off the dark clouds from their mind, whereas we never saw water coming from their eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Safras. Next speaker, panelist, will be Dr. Shantikumar Hetyarachi, who has a PhD in Majority Minority Ethnic and Religious Conflict from the Melbourne School of Divinity, a lecturer and consultant in Religion, Conflict, and Social Cohesion. And he'll talk on his work in community development. Thank you, sir. Uh, my area has been uh, connected to, for the last 12 months, with the Bureau for Rehabilitation, and specifically in three areas. The first is that I was associated and involved in the awareness program for community leadership and religious leadership in three places, particularly in Baunia, Jafta, and Batiklu. And the third one of, fourth one of this series was held in Colombo for the diplomatic com community, INGOs, and for the media community in the city of Colombo. And uh, our special focus in this awareness program has been to encourage religious leadership and to help and support the post-reintegration phase. Because it is my belief that religious communities in this country can help as a receptor community and will come back. The ones who have been re reintegrated. To give them back the lost time and lost opportunity. Therefore, I believe that the religious community in this country has the capacity to offer this specific help. And my area too has been in providing training, particularly in understanding diversity and peace building with, the, with other experts towards peace and reconciliation. And we managed to evolve this mentorship program, which was mentioned by the general in his speech, so that the beneficiaries who have been released, who have been reintegrated, could have these four areas in their hearts and minds. And the part three, I was involved with other experts in providing training of staff in advanced 
psychosocial training. A group of 23 staff, captains downwards, and it was done in a period of three weeks, giving several breaks in a total of period of seven weeks. And I was able to see myself as a non-military person, how it was possible for two enemies fought fiercely in the battlefield, able now to consider the enemy as a colleague, an enemy perhaps as a beneficiary. And uh, I never saw an uh, entitlement of a, a victor in the army. I saw an embracing someone who has renounced the entitlement of a victor and but someone who has embraced a new role as someone who is able to provide support and help. Therefore, understanding the human mistakes, learning and showing empathy, a new outlook to diversity, an attitudinal change in both sides of the group, CAD and the CAD. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shantikumar. Our next speaker, and I'm delighted now to have our two ladies, will be Malhet Terachi, who's a chartered clinical psychologist who completed a BA in psychology at Peradeniya and an MSc in mental health at the University of London and an MSc in clinical psychology in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, for that introduction. Sri Lanka has built a world-class rehabilitation program with the end of the uh, humanitarian, um, with the conclusion of the humanitarian operation. And I call it a world-class program primarily because it addresses the six major components that was denied to the people um, by the former terrorist organization. And these six components were mentioned by our Commissioner General in his speech. And the rehabilitation program was geared towards bringing those six components back into the hearts and minds of the beneficiaries that are undergoing the rehab program. Um, another reason why I call it a world-class program is the standards and the compassion that is maintained within the rehab centers is unprecedented. The success of the rehab program has been assessed and it continues to be assessed as with any good program. Um, the assessment part of the entire program as well as the individual programs have taken place and is continuing um, to be um, assessed. Um, the, in, in keeping with international standards, there was a baseline assessment conducted in December 2009, which assessed the attitudes and the opinions of the beneficiaries that were in rehab. Following uh, beneficiary engagement in the several rehabilitation programs uh, and the activities conducted within the centers, there were subsequent assessments carried out at different time frames. Some of the most significant findings of these assessments are that there was an overall shift in the attitudes and opinions of the beneficiaries. Now, these attitudes and opinions uh, shifted during the course of the period of rehab, and it can be attributed to the ethos. I believe it's the ethos of the centers which promotes um, kindness and compassion, the program itself has uh, several components, and I, I need to emphasize that the rehab program is conducted and implemented by the Army, which includes military and Air Force personnel. So I believe that it has had a large impact because of the way in which the personnel have engaged with the beneficiaries that aspect has created an overall shift. Um, we have also looked at specific programs, and out of the specific programs, the, 
the most psychosocial oriented programs have been the counseling program. And we have Sushila Raja on the panel who will speak further on that. And there has also been the mindfulness training program, which is also known as the Vipassana meditation program and the emotional intelligence program. So while there have been several programs that have contributed to creating a shift in uh, the beneficiaries' attitudes and opinions, there have been the specific programs and the overarching manner in which the personnel have interacted with the beneficiaries. Thank you.